Summary of Moneyball by Michael Lewis In the 1980s, there was a high school baseball player named Billy Bean who was incredibly skilled. Professional baseball scouts would come to Billy's high school games to check out his skills. They told him that he would soon be a world-class player. When Billy graduated, the Mets offered him a deal. He wasn't sure if he should sign at first, but he did. But Billy seemed to lose his ability after he joined the Mets. Billy was easily upset because his friends overshadowed him. He wasn't focused enough to make it as a professional baseball player. Billy quit playing baseball and went to work for the Oakland A's as a talent scout. He worked his way up through the ranks and became the team's general manager. As general manager, Billy used math to pick players in the draft and buy new ones. This would change the sport in a big way. Before 2002, the Oakland A's and a few other teams used math to run their teams in a limited way. However, in 2002, the A's used math in a way that had almost never been seen before. At the same time that Billy was playing for the Mets, there were a lot of changes in baseball. Baseball teams were making a lot of money, and some of the best ones, like the New York Yankees, had so much money that they could pick the most expensive and often best players. At the same time, the 1980s were the beginning of the age of sabermetrics. Bill James, a baseball fan, was the first person to say that standard sports statistics, like batting averages, didn't measure what they were meant to measure and gave a false picture of the sport. James said that if general managers paid close attention to statistics, they could put together a team of athletes who, contrary to what most people think, would play a steady, regular, and controlled game and do better in the long run than flashier, more obviously talented ballplayers. Even though James was smart, his ideas didn't really catch on with big league teams. This was partly because baseball is a traditional sport, partly because baseball has a bias against intellectualism, and partly because coaches and managers didn't want outsiders to tell them how to run their teams. Billy Bean was rare because, as the manager of the Oakland A's, one of the worst teams in Major League Baseball, he had seen firsthand why traditional ways of recruiting players didn't work. Billy had been one of the Mets' best prospects, but he hadn't lived up to his potential. In 2002, Billy decided to change the way the team got new players. Billy didn't do what most general managers do, which is to listen to their team of talent scouts. Instead, he worked closely with his assistant, Paul De Podesta, who was good with numbers. Paul said that most baseball scouts only cared about what they could see for themselves. He also said that general managers could get talented players that other teams didn't think were worth anything by looking at a player's walks, on-base average, the chance of getting on base and not making an out in any given at-bat, and other obscure statistics. Paul understood that if the Oakland A's did this, they could put together one of the best teams in the league for a lot less money. Billy upset his talent scouts in 2002 when he hired a group of players that most other teams had passed over. One of these players was Jeremy Brown, a big shortstop who moved slowly but had a great on-base percentage. Billy and Paul both agreed with the scouts that Jeremy and other unglamorous ballplayers should be picked. Overall, the Oakland A's were able to take more than a dozen of their best picks for the year. This is something that has never happened before in Major League Baseball. Billy uses sabermetrics for more than just the draft when he is in charge of a baseball team. During the first half of the 2002 season, when the Oakland A's don't do very well, he tries to recreate Jason Giambi, a skilled player he had to let go after the 2001 season because the A's could no longer pay him. Billy doesn't try to find another player like Giambi. Instead, he focuses on recreating the aggregate, which means finding multiple players who, when put together, can match Giambi's numbers as a fielder and a batter. Billy uses methods that Paul de Podesta has taken from Wall Street. He treats Giambi as a set of data that can be matched with a group of derivatives taken from other players. One of the people Billy gets to replace Giambi is an older player named David Justice. Justice isn't much of a hitter anymore, but he's great at getting walks, so he helps his team win, even if it's not in a very exciting way. Scott Hatterberg is another player that Billy has added to his team for the 2002 season. 
Before joining the Oakland A's, Hatterberg was nearing the end of his career, and a bad accident had left him with almost no strength in his right arm. Billy hires him anyway because he gets on base a lot and hits consistently. He plays him at first base so he can get more at-bats. Billy keeps moving players to other teams during the 2002 season so that his own team can do as well as possible. He talks with the general managers of several other teams in a smart way to get a bright player named Ricardo Rincon. To pay for Rincon, Bean kicks Mike Magnanti, an experienced player, off the big league team for good. Magnanti accepts the news with quiet, tired acceptance. Chad Bradford, a starter, is another important player the A's got for the 2002 season. Bradford's career has been up and down, but Billy buys him because he knows Chad is a smart thrower with a lot of stamina. Chad is a great example of how the A's new way of winning baseball games works, he doesn't look like a professional athlete, and he doesn't throw very hard, but he has a wild, unusual style that makes hitters hit mostly ground balls. This is a benefit because doubles, triples, and home runs are less likely to happen when a ball is hit to the ground. The A's set a league record by winning 20 games in a row in the second half of the 2002 season. They make it to the playoffs, but they lose to the Minnesota Twins, who are a much worse team. Still, Billy and Paul have shown that general managers can build a strong team by using sabermetrics and economic thought. Other general managers, managers, and teachers get together and say that Billy and Paul's success is just a fluke. But Billy is offered the highest paying deal in baseball history to lead the Boston Red Sox. This shows that people in Major League Baseball know how good he is. Billy turns down the deal after giving it a lot of thought. He says that when he was in high school, he made a big mistake by signing with the Mets, and he will never again make a choice based on money alone. With Paul by his side, he stays the general manager of the Oakland A's. In the epilogue, Jeremy Brown hits a home run without realizing it while playing in a big league training camp. This may be a metaphor for the Oakland A's unusual road to win. About the author. Lewis was born in New Orleans. He went to Princeton and studied art history. After that, he worked for an art dealer. In 1985, he went to the London School of Economics and got an MA in Economics. After that, he worked for a financial company. At the end of the 1980s, Lewis became a writer who wrote about money. His first book, Liar's Poker, came out in 1989. It was about the history of mortgage-backed bonds. Since the 1990s, Lewis has written for many different magazines and newspapers such as the New York Times Magazine, Vanity Fair, and Slate. His other books, like The Blind Side, 2006, The Big Short, 2010, Flash Boys, 2014, and, most recently, The Undoing Project, 2016, all look at a little-known area of statistics or economics. Lewis lives with his wife and three kids in Berkeley, California. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.